Hey everyone, welcome to the Physics Sound Lab. Now I know it feels like life is coming to a halt as we work together to stop the spread of COVID-19 and protect our most vulnerable communities. But physics doesn't stop for anything, and it's our goal to make sure that your education doesn't have to stop for anything either. That's why I'm going to be here in the lab all quarter giving you demonstrations of the fun physics phenomena that you'll be learning about in lecture and in DL. Now we don't have any demonstrations today, but we are going to talk a little bit about two of the most important equations for our first unit of Physics 7b, the Bernoulli equation and the continuity equation. Now these equations are what is known as conservation equations, meaning they just describe something that overall is not changing. You may remember conservation equations from Physics 7a when we did lots of conservation of energy equations. The Bernoulli equation is a lot like that. It describes how the energy density in a fluid such as water changes, or more accurately, how it often doesn't. The continuity equation is similar. It describes how the amount of fluid passing through a given point doesn't change in a particular system. Let's take a moment to look at these equations individually and do some examples. We're going to start with the Bernoulli equation. Now there are five main ways that a fluid can have energy. The first is what's known as pressure. The second is kinetic energy also known as the energy a fluid has because it's moving. The third is gravitational potential energy, which you also may remember from Physics 7a. Now those are the three main ways that a fluid can have energy, but there are additional ways that the energy in a fluid can change. The first is with a pump. A pump adds energy to a fluid, allowing it to, say, climb a hill in a human-made waterfall. The other way a fluid's energy can change is by resistance. If a fluid is in a pipe, it will rub against the edges of that pipe and lose energy to it. This is represented by this term in the Bernoulli equation, I times R, where I stands for the current and R stands for the resistance in the pipe. Now let's do an example. Let's consider the following scenario. Suppose we have a pipe with water flowing through it. Out of the top of the pipe, there is a second pipe that points straight up and is open to the atmosphere at the top. Now what we want to know is what the pressure is in the pipe. We're going to use the Bernoulli's equation to solve this problem. Now there's a couple things we know before we start thinking about the Bernoulli's equation. The first is that the water is open to the air at the top. This means that the pressure at this point in the fluid must equal the pressure of the outside air. This is what is known as atmospheric pressure because, well, it's the atmosphere. What we also know is that the fluid at the bottom of the vertical pipe, known as a standpipe, must have the same pressure as the fluid flowing through the pipe. Let's use this information and Bernoulli's equation to determine the pressure in the pipe. Now, whenever you are working with Bernoulli's equation, a good first step is to figure out which of the terms in the equations you actually need and which ones you can throw away. For our purposes, we're only concerned with the fluid in the standpipe. So let's look at this equation and see which terms we can throw out. We need delta P because that's what we're interested in. We know the pressure up here, it's atmospheric pressure, and we're interested in the pressure down here. So we need to keep this. This second term represents the kinetic energy of the fluid, the energy that the fluid has because it is moving. Now the fluid in the standpipe isn't moving, it's just sitting there. So this term is irrelevant and we do not have to consider it. This term, rho g delta h, represents the difference in pressure in a fluid because of differing heights. Now the fluid in the standpipe is not all at the same height. The fluid at the top of the pipe is above the fluid in the bottom of the pipe. So this term will matter. Next we have E pump. Now looking at this diagram, I do not see a pump. So we do not need to consider that term. The final term is the resistance term. Now remember we threw away the kinetic energy term because the fluid in the standpipe wasn't moving. 
We can do the same here because resistance only occurs when water is actually flowing. In this example, the fluid is not moving through the standpipe and as such there is no resistance. So now we're left with the following equation. We now have all the information we need to determine the pressure at the bottom of the standpipe and therefore the pressure in the flowing water. Let's give this some numbers to make it a little more concrete. Let's call this height 1 meter. Now the other numbers we need are rho and g. Remember, delta p is what we're trying to determine. Rho represents the density of the fluid. For water, density is about 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. G represents the acceleration of gravity near the Earth's surface. For the purposes of this class, we will take that to be 10 meters per second squared. Now, let's write this all out and determine what the pressure is at the bottom of the standpipe. The two points that we're considering in this example are here, the top of the standpoint, and here, the bottom of the standpoint. Delta P represents the difference in pressure between the top of the standpipe and the bottom of the standpipe. Now we know what the pressure is at the top of the standpipe. It's one atmosphere, or in SI units, 100,000 pascals. We're interested in the pressure at the bottom of the standpipe. We don't know what it is yet, so we're going to represent it by a variable, P2. So delta P is just the difference in pressure between the top and the bottom, also known as pressure 2 minus pressure 1. Next, we need to consider this term. We already know what rho and g are. They're 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed and 10 meters per second squared. What about delta H? Well, we know that it's 1, but the question is, is it positive 1 or is it negative 1? Looking at our initial and final pressures, we see that we're taking the pressure at the bottom of the standpipe minus the pressure at the top of the standpipe. The same thing applies here. We're going to take the height at the bottom of the standpipe minus the height at the top of the standpipe. Now we know that the top of the standpipe is above the bottom of the standpipe, so this must be a negative number. So our answer is negative 1 meters. It's how much your height has to change to get from our first point, the top of the standpipe, to our second point, the bottom of the standpipe. All this must equal zero. We can now solve this equation to determine the pressure at the bottom of the standpipe. And there we go. The pressure at the bottom of the standpipe is equal to 110,000 pascals. Next, we're going to talk about the continuity equation. The continuity equation is just the statement about the water flowing through the pipe. A way of thinking about this is like cars driving through a tunnel. If you saw five cars go into one end of the tunnel and only four cars come out the other side, you would be pretty sure that something funny was going on. In the continuity equation, I represents the current flowing through the pipe. The quantity A1 times V1, also known as the current, is just a representation of how much water is passing by a given point in the pipe per second. The amount of water that's going through this part of the pipe has to equal the same amount of water that's going through the second part of the pipe. If this were not the case, water would either be congregating somewhere or it would be spreading out, and that can't happen. So let's do an example. Suppose this is a pipe with water flowing through it. 
The speed of the water is five meters per second, and the area is one meter squared. At the bottom of the pipe, the area is still one meter squared. The question is, how fast is the water traveling at the bottom of the pipe? Now your intuition might tell you that it's going faster. After all, it's gone down a hill, so it should speed up. But we have to be careful about our intuition because physics often doesn't follow them. Looking at the continuity equation, we say that these numbers have to be the same no matter which part in the pipe we pick. Notice the areas are the same, one meter squared up here and one meter squared down here. This means that the velocities must also be the same in order for this equation to be true. If the velocities were not the same, the number on the left-hand side would not equal the number on the right-hand side. Let's do one more example. Suppose we have a pipe that has an area of 2 meters squared on the left-hand side and an area of 1 meter squared on the right-hand side. Water is flowing through the pipe at a rate of 5 meters per second on the left. How fast is the water moving on the right? We can just use our continuity equation to solve this problem. Let's just plug in the numbers. The area on the left is just 2 meters squared while the velocity on the left is just 5 meters per second. This has to be equal to the area times the velocity on the right-hand side. The area is just 1 meter squared, and the speed of the fluid is what we're trying to determine. If you solve this equation, you will find that V2 is equal to 10 meters per second. As you may have expected, when the area of the pipe halved, the velocity of the water flowing through it had to double in order for the continuity equation to remain true. Keep in mind, the continuity equation works no matter which two points you pick in your system. We could have picked a point in between the left-hand side and the right-hand side, say right here. The continuity equation would still have worked just fine so long as we had plugged in the correct area.